Great. Hello, and welcome to the launch for Walk Between Worlds by Samara Breger. Um, my, did I say your name right? Samara, but very close. Damn it. We <laughs> asked you and I said Samara. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Samara. But it's fine. Thank you for joining. And thank you for reaching out to us. We're so happy to have you. We wanted to do it in person, but here we are. And here we this, are. This has allowed our friend in Australia to join us, so we're happy about that. So my name is Greg Newton. I am the co-founder with my partner, Donnie Jokum of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division. And we're a queer bookstore in New York City in the LGBT Center in Manhattan. And I'm actually in the physical store, which I'm super excited about because it was a year and a half or so when we weren't in the store. <laughs> so we finally have reopened. Um, even though some of our events are still virtual, we're glad that we can be in here. And at least if you're in New York, you can swing by the store. Um, but we're also happy that we can reach people all across the world and that folks can buy the book on our online store, which several of you have. And the book's been doing so well that we're sold out, <laughs> or rather the, our supplier is sold out, um, but we will have copies available very soon. So that's a good sign uh, that things are going well. I wanted to let you know that um, we're gonna post this on our YouTube channel. So if you know someone who wanted to be here but couldn't make it, um, it'll be on the Bureau's YouTube channel. So you can check that out. And um, what else did I wanna say? Uh, oh. If you have questions, we're going to be, uh, Samara and Leah will be taking questions after the reading and discussion. And if you want to put that in the, the chat function, I can read those aloud. Um, but we're also a small enough group that I think you can unmute yourself and ask the question when we're ready for that towards the end. Um, but without any further ado, I am going to introduce Leah, who will introduce Samara, and then we'll get started. So hold on one second. Let me pull up that bio, and here we go. So Leah Schnellbach is the senior staff writer at the pop culture website, tour.com, and a fiction editor at the, for the literary journal, No Tokens. Their work has appeared in The Rumpus, Joyland, Electric Literature, Volume One Brooklyn, and other estimable places, Turn-Ons, Espresso, Oreos, Well-Deployed By Lighting, Turn offs, clickbait, lima beans, the death of the author. <laughs> you can find them on Twitter at cloudy underscore vision. Please give a warm, visible welcome to Leah Schnellbaum. Yay! Hello. <laughs> um, at Samara's request, I am going to read something very brief and then I am going to introduce the star of the show. So. Forgive my downcast reading off the screen eyes, please. Since I don't have a printer. <laughs> this is a very short story called You Stomp. She took her friend's advice and made cookies. Three different friends in two different cities who didn't know each other, though she had introduce introduced the two in the same city once and they were friends on the internet now, had each told her to make a batch of cookies, take them up there, smile, be nice, and then mention the noise as an afterthought. Oh, sometimes I can hear you walking around up there. Not, not too much, but sometimes. She packed the cookies into a tin. She'd bought a tin. She waited until the stomping began again. He was certainly home, and she was assuming it was a guy because what woman would stomp so hard? She braced herself for anger, for finding out that he walked with a cane, that his wife had died and he stomped because he missed her, that his apartment was so roach infested that he had to dance across the backs of bugs. She was ready for anything. Her knocks were too quiet, but then she was afraid to keep knocking. If he had infuriating, right? But then how long should she stand here waffling? Why did waffling have this other meaning? I found it amusing that it was carried through, through the decades to now. Did it have some root in the invention of the waffle? Was it one of those words from a different language that got twisted and molded in foreign mouths until here we were in the United States in a new century with this weird word that shouldn't mean what it meant? The door opened. 
Her eyes shut themselves against the light. She felt the lids squeezing across her eyeballs, hugging them. She worked them open again, jerking like she was tugging a blind pole that refused to cooperate. The person in front of her was blinding to look at. Once her eyes were safely closed again, she could still see him, a blistering white outline. Sorry, it was the most beautiful voice she had ever heard. I wasn't thinking, you can open now. As he said now, her eyelids flew back up like they were racing each other. And there he was, impossibly beautiful. The face was the light of dawn spilling out over an untouched field of snow. His eyes were warm lights in the windows of the home you'd fought for years to return to. And now here you were on the threshold after perils unnumbered, whole and safe. The miracle. I, she said, he nodded. The nod took in everything. The time she wet herself in second grade and Mrs. Blevins made her sit in it and the look on her mother's face when she came home. The way her cat's muscles felt after the vet gave him the last shot, but before it was over. How much she loved sex, even the first time, and how dirty that made her feel. Every single thought she'd ever had in church. Holy, unholy, mundane, shopping list, jokes for Twitter. But that meant when the brow darkened, it was a storm rolling over a churning sea, ink and waves crashing over every word man had ever written, drowning out in a formless ocean. Pacing helps me think, he said. I need movement to create. And where were you when the morning stars sang together and all my sons shouted for joy? Have the gates of death been opened to you? Have you seen this, the doors of the shadow of death? Her head was shaking itself. Her arms stretched out to him, her home, her joy. He took the cookies. She walked backwards until her hip grazed the stair rail. Create a carpet! And she spun and ran, each step meeting her feet like rising, like rising boulders, descending the stairs like climbing a high mountain, until she was back at her own door, behind it, leaning against it, feeling her heart in her chest, a panicked dove. It was quieter after that. Six days later, she found her tin washed at her doorstep. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and now I get to introduce Samara Breger. Samara Breger, Breger is a writer and performer from New York. In her past life, she was an Emmy nominated journalist covering productive and sexual health. Now she writes about she writes books about magic and feelings, and she has a crush on every character. Hi. Hi, I'm Samara. Thank you all for coming. This is very exciting. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit from my debut novel, Walk Between Worlds, which is why we're all here. Um, so where we are in the book, it's there are gonna be no spoilers, but um, the characters are in the middle of the forest. They've been walking around for a while and they're um, reaching a lot of emotional highs and to connect with each other, they read a dirty book together, um, which is I think fairly relatable. Um, and this little section is I guess my, my love letter to all the dirty fantasy books that, that I read. So here we go. <clears throat> The centaur studied the traveler who had entered his magical glen. He was frail, probably having run for days from whatever creature, man or magical beast, had been in pursuit of him. His clothes were torn. Through the large rip on the front of his shirt, the centaur saw a set of well-formed abdominal muscles dusted with a light smattering of fair hair. What ho, human, he called. Why do you traipse through my magical lands? No human is given welcome here. I have nowhere to turn. The human was on his knees, hands clasped in a sign of prayer. Please allow me safe rest and I will be forever indebted to you. The centaur scratched his chin and ran his fingers through his short magical beard. On his knees, the traveler was at his mercy. He could bring the man back to the council of centaurs, which was magic, and receive a magical reward. And yet something about the man drew him in. Perhaps it was the openness of his wet mouth or the flush of his pale cheek. Or maybe, and most likely, it was the erection tenting the front of his tattered trousers. I have never seen a centaur before, said the man, bringing the heel of his hand to his member and pressing down. You are unlike any other creature I have laid my eyes upon. Is it 
the man bit his lip, true what they say about centaurs, that we have the girth of a horse, that our manhood is solid like a rod of brass, that we can give a man pleasure so great it will ruin him for human men, ha, all true. Also, they are magic. The man was panting now, wantonly rubbing his hand along his turgid length, and that you have a stamina so great you can spend hours, even days, making love. Why don't you come here and find out, weary traveler, per the centaur, beckoning the man like a fish to a magic lure. Thank you. There, <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Leah, Leah suggested I read that part of the book, so you can blame them. Blame them. <laughs> I really love that. So. Thank I you. love the whole book, but I really love Thank that. you. Yeah. I'm, I'm I very really relieved to hear you say that. Oh, yeah, of course. No, I really liked uh, porn as a bonding. Like, it, it, it was such a nice moment in a very tense section of the book to have this sort of like read along moment between these two characters. Now, I have a bunch of questions for you, but I yeah. was, I'm gonna try to not spoil things. Um, so- Spoil a couple of things. Oh. I'm not light, light spoilers. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, I wanted to start by saying, uh, this book is delightful. So if you don't already you. have it, get it. Um, the way that you've built the characters, um, you've created like very real organic characters that grow through their journey, um, which I love. And you've kind of built the world building into the character growth, which I thought was really well done because it's, kind of, it's hard to create a full world. Like this felt like a very, very real lived in world. And it's hard to do that without letting it get top heavy. Um, so that, and then the other thing, and again, I don't wanna, say too much, but I loved the way you sort of build a story about justice and learning, learning the truth about certain things and discovering that maybe you're not always the hero. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you built it in a very uh, careful way that we're basically learning that along with various characters, um, that they sort of, that it's part of their character growth. Um, so I yeah. wanted to start with that because I really Sure. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Well, my, my thing with the world is that it's very tropey. It relies heavily on what we all think about when we think about fantasy. Um, not, I mean, not what we all think about. That's a huge assumption. But what, what most of us think about when we think about fantasy, we think about knights and, you know, fairies and princesses and kings and queens. And my big thing was like, I was less interested in the world building and more interested in like playing in the space, I guess, which is why I, I sat so heavy into those tropes. And when I first started writing this book, I, I sort of, I wasn't sure whether I would finish writing this book. I hadn't written fiction since high school. Um, and then I was at a particularly low point in my life and I just started writing just to see what would happen. And I started off just like, I'll make this as easy for myself as possible. I will not worry about a map. I will not worry about like the history so much. I will just dive right in and sort of see what happens. And so the characters were developed at the same time as the world. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's why you see a sort of parallel development, I guess, throughout the book. Um, and as far as like discovering you're not the main character, yeah, like that was a big, that was a big thing for me. I wanted a resolution that felt big, but didn't, didn't involve violence. There's so much fighting um, in fantasy, which is beautiful, big, beautiful, sweeping, epic battles. I love them. Um, but a thing that I learned about myself recently, and I keep learning about myself, is that I am very sensitive. I'm very sensitive. And I think I was watching Game of Thrones and it was one of the earlier seasons. And, um, you know, Rob Stark is like doing all this fighting and he's got all these armies and there are some battle scenes and he's got this like triumph. And the thought in my head was like, people died. People died, man. Like <laughs> you're, you're looking at this big map 
and you're looking at all these lands you're getting and we sympathize with you we're meant to sympathize with you and and you know we know that you're naive and oh, that's your fatal flaw and, but 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 the part that sort of pulled me back was like man people died yeah. is it really that important oh my god um and yeah i think you know maybe i'm just particularly sensitive but i knew that i wanted to have a knight character who takes a a, a a a bigger view of the situation and thinks to herself oh shit uh <laughs> i uh, i might be responsible for like a lot of deaths and um a lot of colonizing mm -hmm. um and it was it was sort of a struggle for me as i was writing this book to figure out how a, a revolutionary well, um uh, how a love interest who has a sort of different view of of you know the the king and his military conquests might actually see her as a person and like a viable love interest and might like understand who this person is um after she has committed a number of atrocities and not just you know participated in them but like was responsible for them yeah uh in a big way so yeah. I'm like kind of unthinkingly gloried in them. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. But I really, yeah, and I love that when there is violence in the book, it's it's treated with real weight. Like you actually, um, you've written, there isn't very much on the page, which I also appreciate it because personally I too am really sick of reading that. No. Um, but when you have it there, it's actually treated as a thing that would change a person that they have committed yeah. violence or even the, that if you have some sort of trauma that it just doesn't, it doesn't just go away. Yeah. It's something you can just kind of talk through and leave behind you. It's always part of you. So it yeah. it's your decisions as a, like through the present. Um, For sure. In the first draft of the book, there was more shaking and vomiting. So <laughs> that got cut back. But yeah, I, I don't know. I thought like, God, a person who has never seen violence has to kill somebody in a pretty brutal way. Mm -hmm. Like what, what would happen after that? Nothing good, nothing good immediately. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> maybe nothing good for quite a while. But that actually, how many, how many drafts did you go through? Because I wanted to ask you about what your, you said that you were wrote this basically in like kind of a, a rocky point. So yeah. what was the writing process and how many drafts did you go through to get to the final? So I wrote this in about two months in 2018. And it was something like, you know, 80,000 words of just like, bleh. and everything was different. And there were so many different, so many different like tropes that I had thrown in and so many different, cause like I, you know, I had, uh, I hadn't written anything in a while. So I was just like, I want to include this and that and this. And there was like another little porn book section in there too. And there were like mermaids. And I was like, this, that, this, the other thing. Mm. Um, and then I couldn't sell it uh, to anybody. I couldn't get any agent that was interested in me. And then I um, got in touch with Bywater Books who are now my publisher. And I sent them my book and they said, okay, well, um, here are 12, there's an email. And if you print it out, it will be 12 pages. And there is a graph in it. There are graphics in it. And here are all of the things that you need to work on with this book. And you can rewrite it. Um, book. And I said, I will just rewrite it. Um, so I rewrote it to a length that is twice as was connected with my editor, Stephanie Jewell, who is very cool. Um, and she said that I have to cut a lot of it. And I said, cool. And then I basically did another rewrite. Um, I kept a lot from that last draft, but, but it was sort of another rewrite. So I guess I've written this book three times. This is my first book and also my third book, Excellent. essentially. Excellent. Because yeah, it feels, um like I said, it feels really lived in and it feels effortless. Like it really, like reading it, it felt like, you know, you were, you were in there with the characters. There is no point, cause you were talking about playing with tropes, but I didn't, they didn't feel like tropes that had been turned into people. 
they felt like sort of allusions to tropes, if that makes sense. Um, they all felt I, uh, real. <laughs> I, I feel like I, I know these people pretty well at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, <laughs> who's your favorite to write? Um, uh, James, um, because I relate most to him. Um, I have this like impulse when things are going wrong to make jokes about it. Um, James was very easy to write. Brella was the hardest to write and most rewarding because I wanted to make her so lovable mm -hmm. um, at first. And I also wanted to make her a little bit scary. And I don't know if I've accomplished either one of those things, but she, but she definitely feels like, like a person to me at this point. Yeah, I yeah. was particularly taken with the fact that you kept describing her as breakfast. Yeah, she's breakfast. I thought that was <laughs> the way um, this is, Brella is a, is a kind of larger than life character. Um, she's a very passionate person and yes. she's uh, a brewer and is trying, it, she is like a, um, obsessed with making sure that everyone on in the world basically has access to a to a, not just a decent life but a happy and fulfilling life yeah bread and roses probably, for yeah sure. it's yeah. a very hard way to be in a fantasy yeah. kingdom <laughs> where, where there's a pretty strict uh cap so but every time not every time but many of the times that you that you write about her you touch base with the idea of her as just being um nourishing yeah. and yeah i really love descriptions because i just thought it was such a nice kind of sideways way to describe a person and talk about how uh how welcoming she is and how kind of nurturing she is but without ever making her seem uh soft i guess if yeah. that makes sense yeah like, she's not squishy <laughs> no absolutely not no she's yeah she's she's an oak tree yeah um yeah, she's unmoving, but she'll give you shade. So yeah, that's that's kind of how I see her. Yeah, I think, well, I was gonna say, I think she might be my favorite, except that I actually think that aunt and uncle are my favorite, but. Yeah, yeah, they're fun. Talk about aunt and uncle, because I don't, I would love to hear about aunt and uncle, but again, I don't know if they're a surprise. I don't wanna um, preempt it. <laughs> I wanna talk about aunt and uncle. Um, yeah, when I was thinking about magical people, um, I wanted them to all be dangerous, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, they're called aunt and uncle because these magical people don't quite have the same use of names as we do. I thought that'd be like a, a quick way to just show like, they're, they're not people. Mm -hmm. They're not quite people and they're not quite not people. Um, and even like the jolliest and most welcoming of them who is uncle is like a big bug who dies every year <laughs> and he's when scratch first sees him she she's freaked out because he's a big bug um and aunt and uncle i you know when i was first writing this in a, in a previous draft it was much clearer that aunt and uncle and nana as well all of their names came from um Vel and Brella and their family just like addressing them yeah like they had either names that don't exist or just like unspeakable or will melt your brain um but to these people who have spent all of this time in this forest and like accessing this magical place like they are sort of aunt and uncle figures um and I wanted very much to to have some like spooky lore with them to have some like ancient spooky um but you know like gosh one of the things i love about fantasy is that things are things can be so romantic in this like eternal way in this forever way um and i wanted these two characters to just have something sweeping and terrible and miserable and also like lovely but but lovely in the way that you can't really look directly at it because you're like you know, you're either like all your flowers are coming off or you're like wondering whether he's gonna come back this time or like you're just waiting for him to die again. You know, something that is just like 
really lovely, but also like on the other side of the water and you can't quite touch it. Like nothing that's gonna be comfortable. Um, and I really like them. I like them a lot. You know, they're, they're, they're scary. And I like that ant is uh, very pretty and also very terrifying. So yeah. one, of my, one of my favorite combos. Exactly, and that was her, um, her sort of moment with Scratch was really one of my favorites because I really liked how you set up, um, you set this up as sort of, it, it sort of felt very Alice in Wonderlandy where they're sort of meeting and at first you're, it's, it feels very warm and welcoming and then it's warm and welcoming, but then there's kind of another side to it that's a lot more threatening. Yeah, um, and, and that it's sort of meant to be warm and welcoming, like, <laughs> they're meant to be lovely you're meant to look at them and get close to them and then you don't realize that you're in danger until you're far too close yep yeah. <laughs> excellent i also and i just love the fact that there is with every character in this book you could have a whole separate like if you wanted to keep writing books in this world um you have folded in so many gorgeous little stories that could come out and be their own like epic fantasy which especially Aunt and Uncle, I really like. But yeah. I mean, I would read 300 pages of Nana if you ever wanted to write 300 pages of Nana. So would I, so would I, was, uh, the Nana Chronicles. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> no, she's so good. And like, and everything, the way that you sort of, um, you use these, like you, you take these characters, but the way that you describe them, they seem very new too which i really appreciated just the Thanks. like as you I'm, again i'm not going to give stuff away but as you see nana at first you kind of gradually figure out what nana looks like as, yeah and it, it sort of felt like you were kind of panning down yeah the camera as you described her which i really yeah love that um well okay my other kind of opener question was just who are your who would you say are sort of your fantasy pantheon Mm -hmm. And who were the more specific um, influences on this book in particular? Well, I have been thinking about this because I <laughs> don't have a particularly traditional route. Like I, I did read, you know, Tamora Pierce growing up, but my, who I loved, but what I really, what really stuck with me was that I read all of the Oz books growing up, mm -hmm. um, all of the L. Frank Baum Oz books. And I... They're, I, I consider them fantasy books, but they don't have a traditional like magic system to them. Like the magic system is shoes and then later it is belt um, and uh, bubble. And um, that, I think that was uh, kind of the ethos that I went in this with, just sort of like, you can sort of tell reading those books that like Al Frank Baum didn't have shit planned. He didn't have shit planned. He wrote a book and then he wrote another book and then he kept writing books. And he was like, what if they can take their heads off? And you're like, wow. And he's like, and this, and like is the second book or the third book. It's like, what if there's a little boy and he's doing this whole Oz thing like Dorothy did, but oh, he's a princess. Like, it's just really wild. Um, and that was the sort of thing that really <laughs> stuck with me that like, you can change the rules constantly. Um, and you can't, you can in children's books. Um, you, adults will like, oh, did you mention this thing? And then it was later this thing. Um, and I'm like, oh yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, um, an earlier version of this book had it, had it really set up to be a trilogy and had all of these little loose ends. And now I have a couple of loose ends, but not as many loose ends. Um, and then I, you know, sort of peeled those all back and I was like, let me just have fun right here right now. Um, and that was very much it for me. Also Shrek, the movie Shrek. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Also Shrek 2. I was gonna. The sequel to Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this felt like a, this felt Shrek inspired. <laughs> <laughs> it was, which again, I love that you are you're writing in this tradition and you're taking, you're questioning the parts of it that actually need to be questioned. You're taking the important bits really seriously, but then you're also just having a lot of fun with it. It's, it's fun. Fantasy is fun. Like, yeah, it's, it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. It's silly and like, 
you know, I love, I love to get deep in the paint Arthurian style and just like be real serious about all. I love, oh, I love that shit. But when you, I don't know, it's silly. It's like, it's D and D games. It's, it's, it's fun. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> nice to agree on that. Yeah. Oh, oh, so, okay. That was my other. So do you have, what is your, what is the Pantheon? Or are they, are, are the constellations just made up as they go? Because I also wanted to know more about the cheesemonger. The cheesemonger god of cheese is a very important deity. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you caught this, but all the, there are only two cheeses in the book, but they're um, both Game of Thrones jokes. And um, I sent my publisher, Oh, you froze. Did, did, are you frozen? Are you there? Oh no, are they frozen? Okay, well, I'm, I'll, I'm gonna talk about the cheese god. So um, if you haven't read the book, there are uh, constellations and the constellations are gods. And one of the gods is the cheesemonger, god of cheese. And he's, he's brought up the most. Um, and uh, I sent my publisher you know, when we were doing like the final proofs, um, I sent her all of these options for like what the cheese can be called. Um, and they were all Game of Thrones jokes and she took her pick. So we've got a soft Eddard and a, a stuffed Walder. Um, Cause Walder Frey ate his son in a very casual, fun and exciting way. So we lost Leah briefly. It looks that way. <laughs> I don't... Okay. Where are you, Leah? Where are you? I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> I have I have faith they will be back. Aha. Aha. Oh yay! Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. I think it just went. Yeah. I think the internet just kind of died on me for a second. Um. Oh, but okay. So, yeah, I wanted to know yeah, about yeah. the constellations. And specifically yes. the cheesemonger because the I cheesemonger uh god of cheese as i was telling as i was telling everyone while you were gone uh is is the only god that i've thought about a lot um the other gods were just sort of for kicks i um i like when i was younger i one of the things that um i'm jewish and one of the things that i was jealous about with catholics is that they had all of these saints Mm. it to me it felt like receptionists for god um you don't have to like busy god with this like big ask you just talk to one of his like specialized receptionists um and i really i don't know i wanted i wanted it to be a polytheistic world with like these major gods gods you know the uh, the twice buried the mother father son brother you know whatever um but the gods sort of came up as they did. And um, in the book, you know, you can see them all in the sky. And I wanted it to be very clear that when Scratch steps into the forest and she looks up in the sky, like her gods are not there. They are, they have left her. Um, and she is completely in a world she does not understand. And these magical beings in this forest are far realer and far more present than these gods that she has casually um, looked up to for her whole life. Um, so yeah, so there is no set pantheon. I do not have every god listed, um, but I, I like them. I'll make more. I love the gods. I love the gods. Yeah. Because they were all, yeah. I really liked hearing about. I really liked hearing about them kind of making up their own as they went as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then I wanted to know if you had, like, first of all, what is your, like, do you have a particular, like, ritual to, to your writing? I've just started one um, <laughs> uh, for the new book that I'm writing. Um, 
I've started the Pomodoro technique, <laughs> which is working out pretty well for me. I don't know. I have, I have a uh, pretty wild ADHD. Um, so the way I wrote this book was sort of in just like big hyper-focus vomit sessions. Um, and then I couldn't look at it for days. And then I would come back hyper-focused for like eight hours and then not look at it again. Um, and I'm learning that that is unsustainable. Like this, uh, what a thing my therapist and I talk about is that um, <laughs> I am not only like writing a, I was not only writing a book, but I'm, I'm also learning how to be a writer. Um, yeah. And I'm still, I, I, you know, I know that I am very early on my journey in figuring out what works for me in that respect. I like lighting candles. I like things that smell good. You know, when I am trying to move from one realm to another, I'll like sniff perfume and just like enter this new calm space of I am writing right now. Um, but I, I, I walked into this extremely naive, you know, I was just like, I'll just write and see what happens. And now as a person who wants to keep writing, who wants to keep being a writer, I, I cannot be doing these big, exhausting, emotionally draining, you know, sessions and then walking away and feeling like garbage about walking away for the next few days. Like I'm figuring out how to um, balance all of that. And it's strange, it's strange. Yeah, what's yeah. Yeah, it's a weird thing where you're, you basically are carrying other worlds around in your head with you. Yeah. You have to try to visit them and then figure out how to describe them in a way that will make sense to other people. Yeah, and I feel a responsibility to these characters once I, once I make them. I don't know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to get too, you know, emotionally wired and then leave them alone and, and uh, yeah forsake them that's a good impulse <laughs> god i hope so <laughs> yeah but i also I, because the other thing obviously that stood out about to this to me about this book was that the way that you've sort of worked like it is very much a queer fantasy yeah like it's very much the 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 society it's sort of worked into the society in a way that is um it's part of the culture, although there are people that would maybe would be bristly about it. But yeah, we think it's just sort of there. But also the way that you're writing, and this always gets weird and hard to talk about, <laughs> but the way that you're writing and the way that you're describing the world to me felt like a queering of fantasy itself. Like the way that you're sort of taking this world and the, the things that you're choosing to focus on and the things that you're choosing to describe versus like what you're ignoring. Um, it just felt like a kind of a different lens to look at a fantasy world through. And then also just the fact that most of the book takes place in what would be considered a liminal space. Mm -hmm. Like almost all of it is either in this, in the wild forest or else in the between area, which I, again, I don't want to say too much about the between because I don't want to, um, I don't want to get, cause it's gorgeous. <laughs> and I don't want to give, I don't want to give stuff away for people that haven't read it yet. Um, because I just kept rereading that section um but i just i uh, i don't even know if this is really a question exactly but it's just sort of like how did you first of all did you have any sort of um did you have any writers or works that you read that you considered like sort of this is an example of a queer fantasy as opposed to a i don't know like a yeah straight well, first of all i was really hoping that you would say that i was really hoping that somebody would say that um and that it is you it's very very special to me so thank you oh yeah no it's really in there like it was really yeah it's beautiful <laughs> uh, you know i um yeah i i definitely wanted it to be from a from a queer lens um from a you know social justicey lens and from a from a less like kings and queens and more like the people that actually have to live with what they do and the choices that they make and like how to exist within a society that is not necessarily built for you. Um, I so part of the reason I started read, uh, writing this book was because I read a book by an author named T.J. Klune, oh, yeah. um, 
and yeah, he's he's cool. Um, this book that he wrote was uh, The Lightning Struck Heart, and it is a gay fantasy book that is like wildly tropey and very like very jokes very modern very like you know the characters have like super modern names like ryan um but when i read it i was like damn like this is fun and i want something like this but about women um and then i looked for that and then i couldn't find that and then i said all right i'll i'll fucking write it you know um and you know, if you read that book and you read my book, there are definite, you can definitely see the influences, but it became its own thing very quickly. Um, and yeah, and you know what? A lot of the books I read are queer books. I think that I, I have not read a book. Well, recently I read a book where um, it focuses on heterosexual people doing heterosexual things by a heterosexual writer in a heterosexual world. Primarily, I just, I write, I read queer books by queer authors, and I think that that has sort of wormed its way into my subconscious, wormed its way into my writing um, in a way that, like, you know, I, I definitely make conscious choices. Um, the less, like, primary narrative, like, expected, you know, narrative lens um but but I yeah but I also think I've sort of incepted incepted myself <laughs> yeah it's the best way to write I think yeah yeah you kind of have to trick yourself into it absolutely but, yeah well that was my other question which is again a slightly more general one was just like I don't know I don't know if you had this but when the lockdown started I my ability to read kind of ground to a halt yeah. So I wanted to know if you had that, if you had a similar thing, and also if there was a book that kind of broke you out of that, and if you had anything you wanted to recommend, other than obviously this book, which everyone should get. <laughs> yeah, I highly recommend this book that I wrote. Um, <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, yeah, the, uh, the lockdown totally broke my brain. I could only read romance. Um, I read a lot of historical um, gay man romance. Um, a lot of works by KJ Charles and Kat Sebastian. Um, they're very like Regency British men in fancy clothes having long looks at each other. And there is something very um, comforting about like, you know, they're gonna be looking at each other and then you know they're gonna stop. And then you know they're gonna do it again. And then you know they're gonna, oh, and then they're gonna fall in love. Like that, the beats of that, were very comforting to me knowing that I was not going to be left um at the end just like with a with a hole in it, with like just wanting I I was really reaching for books that I knew would be satisfying and that I also knew like wouldn't my focus was so split I I was having a hard time with more than three characters like oh there's another person here <laughs> Who is that? Um, so yeah, like really formulaic books really, really got me through. And then, you know, more romances. There's this, oh, there's this book that I love um, called Rosalind Pine Takes the Cake. And it is a, the protagonist is a bisexual woman and she has these two, you know, male love interests, but her ex, is her best friend and she's a woman obviously and like and it takes place in like a fake great british bake-off and like that's the wavelength i was on i was on like a bisexual rom-com great british bake-off wavelength i could read that book and then i could watch the great british bake-off like that's mm, that's that's where it hit me yeah that was my sweet spot that's beautiful <laughs> <laughs> bisexual bake-off yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was um so that kind of leads into the next question, which was just like you mentioned working on you mentioned that you're working on something now. And I wanted to know if you wanted to talk about it. If not, it's okay. Sure, <laughs> yeah, it's vampires. I'm working on vampires. Um <laughs> so there are two authors. 
There's two authors of Bywater books, and their names are Anna Burke and Jen Alexander. I recommend both of their works very highly. Um, and they came to me and they said, hey, do you want to write a vampire novella? And I said, tight. Let's all write vampire novellas. Great. And then Anna said, you know what? Mine is a full-length novel. Um, let's all write full-length novels. And I was like, Jesus Christ. Um, but it, it, that turned out to be great. Um, I think it, I think it will turn out to be great. Um, I am writing about vampires and I was never, I read Twilight during the lockdown, which was, hmm. I, I loved it. It was terrible. It was, te it was so bad. I loved every goddamn second of reading it. I don't know what to tell you. And then I read Midnight Sun, which yeah. is Twilight from Edward's perspective. And then I read Twilight After Death, which is Twilight again, but the genders are swapped. Uh, and that was Stephanie Meyer saying, it's not anti-feminist. It is, it is absolutely anti-feminist. It is fucked up. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but I read all of it. Anyway, vampires. So I'm writing about vampires right now. Um, and what I like about these vampires, because I was never really drawn to them. I'm, I've got a pretty weak stomach for blood. Mm -hmm. um, but what I like about them is this eternal thing. And my vampires, um, sneak preview, my vampires, you know, see each other through various points in history, you know, throughout time. I was really influenced by, did you watch um, the Good Omens series? Oh yeah. Do you remember that part um, in the beginning of one of the episodes? Where they're just, yeah, they're just like in ancient Greece and then they're here again and they're, you know, minor. Uh, for, for anybody that, Good Omens is, uh, they're two best friends, but really, I think they're a couple. And best friends right, who are just like there with it. But uh, it's, a, it's an angel and a demon. And they, ha they share this friendship that goes over thousands and thousands of years. <laughs> yeah, so. exactly. Um, and I wanted something like that. I was really inspired by that about, you know, the circumstances change, but the people do not. Um, and one of the things that my vampires find frustrating about being a vampire and about like seeing this other person that they love, you know, throughout time is that they do not change and you don't get this rewarding little bit of like a gray hair or a wrinkle or like they need glasses now. Um, and, and that is what I'm writing about. I'm writing about these vampires. They're lesbians for sure. <laughs> That sounds fantastic. <laughs> God, I hope it is. <laughs> well, that's so exciting. Um, okay, well, we're at we're close to the hour, so I just want to know: is there are there anything? That's not a sentence. Was there anything that you anything wanted me to ask you that I didn't get to? No, no. I feel, I feel, I feel well and truly asked. <laughs> thank you so much, Leah, for asking me all those excellent questions. Wow, thank you. No, thank you for inviting me to ask you questions. Hell yeah. I loved this book. So, oh, I'm I, like so I said, glad. I want to, yeah. I want to, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not going to give anything away. <laughs> I want people to be surprised by it. Um, but yeah, I guess if we want it, if people had questions too, like if we want to have audience questions, because I wanted to leave enough time in case anybody else had a for sure. Yeah, if anyone, if anyone has it, oh, Lindsay, Hi. you may unmute yourself. Yes, hello, hello everyone. Hi, <laughs> well, I'm so excited for you. This is such a, a big deal and I'm so excited to see you here talking about it. And the thing that um, I was most interested in hearing about was what, um, what was it like trying to choose character names? Because I always feel like that's such a struggle to think of like, what's the identity of my character and how did you settle on some of these names? Because some of them are certainly, uh, you know, funny or interesting. Um, so a lot of it was make a noise and then see what comes from that noise. Um, no, Brella, uh, Brella was like the most, the most carefully considered name. Um, for those who, it's not, I guess it's not a spoiler to say what Brella is short for, just short for Umbrella. Um, and I, a lot of the names, you know, I'm not, they weren't, it's not like, you know, I'm using like Latin roots and carefully hiding little secrets in the names. Um, it just sort of, 
in an earlier version of the book, there was a character named Angelo. And one of my readers said, no, you cannot do that. Um, so I, I just sort of messed around with them until I felt that something felt right. That's kind of it. Scratch always was named Scratch. I had no conscious thought about it. I wrote something down. There was a character named Scratch and that was it. That's a good question. I feel like I don't, I don't, I don't have a satisfactory answer, but thank you for your question, Lindsay. I feel like that's how um, parents choose their baby's names as well. They just try to sound it out until it feels right. Yes, exactly. Well, awesome. Great choices. Thanks. And we have a question from Kelsey. Who is your least favorite character? <laughs> um, probably Levon, the 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 sneaky um, sneaky hand to the king. He's a sneaky, greasy man. Fuck that guy. It's fun. It's fun to write bad guys, but as far as like objectively, who's the worst? He's the worst. Um. But he was fun to write because he's a mean, nasty, bad man. <laughs> <laughs> mean people can be interesting, they can. They can. <laughs> even if you don't want them in your life. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and we have a question from A. Wack. Do you think you will write another book in this world? I want to, I'd originally planned to, there are a few loose ends that I need to tie up, but the next book in this world feels like it has to be a lot of strategy, a lot of, you know, politicking and a lot of war. Um, and that absolutely gives me pause and I want to do it, but I want to do it right. And I feel like I need to take a break from this world for a little while while I, while I figure out how how to do that right because that is certainly more in the realm of traditional fantasy um and yeah i want to do it but i want to do it my way and i need to figure out how so yes and also mm. <laughs> fair enough yeah um, david brager uh oh, that's my ha dad hi dad <laughs> <laughs> have you cast the film <laughs> No, no, yeah, I did. No, because nobody, nobody fits the, the perfect specifications. No, I have not cast the film. I would cast it with all unknowns, all ta talented, exciting unknowns. And then some like, you know, like prestige actors for the, for the smaller parts. I like that. And then the one from Shape of Water can be Uncle, the Doug Jones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, I hope I'm pronounced Champagne. Champagne. Uh, it's is, Champagne. Champagne. <laughs> is there one single sentence in the story that you are particularly delighted by, and will you read it aloud? Ooh. Yeah, sure. So there's a line in the book that I originally wrote about a dildo and then I cut the dildo. And so I wrote it about the love interest instead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll read that. Um, and it takes place in the between. And if I can't find it. Oh, well. Oh, here we are. Bup, 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 bup. Wherever it is, but it, essentially, I think the whatever she laughs at you in every color um, is a line that I like a lot. And originally, um, it was about a dildo that she was intimidated by. It laughs at you in every color, but now it's about a person, and I think it fits a lot better. So <laughs> I'm happy for that. Although I like the idea of a laughing dildo. <laughs> <laughs> metaphorical <laughs> literal laughing dildo humiliating <laughs> and dad or david as he's known to the rest of us jolene mm -hmm. wants you to know it was her question that's about the casting 
Okay, thank you, Jolene, my stepmother. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question, comment, a concern? Ross says, no question, just wanted to say that I just started reading the book and I love it so far. Thank you, Ross. Excellent. I also wanted to say um, thank you to everyone who purchased the book through us. And we will get that to you as soon as we can. <laughs> it's a good problem that it's not available. It's a good problem, but it is a problem, yeah. But that's really great that it's been selling so well. I'm happy for you. Thank you. Um, and those of you who bought it through us know that we will get that to you as yeah. soon as we can. <laughs> I also wanted to say thank you to those of you who donated to us um, because we appreciate that. For those of you who don't know, the Bureau is an all volunteer bookstore in the center. So we have no paid staff. So, so those donations and those sales, that's what make this little dream possible. And for any of you who are in New York, I hope you'll come visit us. Um, we're inside the LGBT Center on the second floor. And um, if you're not in New York City, well, you should plan a visit. <laughs> Maybe not now, <laughs> but eventually. <laughs> um, and stop by. Um, and Samara, maybe, maybe for your next book, maybe for vampires, we'll be mm -hmm. uh, in person this time. I would love that. Yes. That would be lovely. Yes. Um, but did you want to say anything else before we wrap this up? Uh, no, I just want to say thank you. Um, if you liked it, uh, I would love a, a rating on Goodreads or Amazon if, if anybody feels the inclination. If not, just, you know, uh, read the book. Thank you. And th thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it that, you know, this is my first book. I'm a new writer and it's, it feels very, very special to have you all here. So thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and we're going to post this on our YouTube channel. So uh, if you know anyone who wanted to be here and couldn't make it, they can see it there. And Samara, I will send that to you so you can share as well. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Samara. Thank you, Leah. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Samara. Bye. Thank you, Leah. It's so good. <laughs> Have a lovely night.